Welcome to Digital Marketing Done Right, a customer success spotlight from Rainmaker Digital Services and Business Radio X. We cover digital marketing success stories drawn from real Rainmaker platform clients and showcase how they use the Rainmaker platform to build their business. Now, here's your host. Lee Cantor here with David Brandon, another episode of Digital Marketing Done Right, and this is going to be a good one. David, who do we got this week? Hey, Lee, we've got Heath Reese here. So, how's it going? Good, great. Keith, before we yeah. get too far into things, tell us a little bit about your work today. How are you serving folks? Okay, so today, for the last 30 years or so, I've been a consultant with health practitioners and health coaches and I just help them create platforms, sell their books, create products, et cetera. So how'd you get into this line of work? Were you always involved in this type of content creation? Well, way back when, in the 80s, when I graduated college, my mom had been a, what was called in the 70s, a hippie doctor. You know, she used herbs, right, under the counter. And so I was really interested in alternative medicine. And it just so happened that a lot of alternative medicine companies in the 80s needed marketing help. And so out of college, I just went down that track. I helped supplement companies market their products. And so I did that for about 10 years. I was fortunate to work with a lot of startups that sold lots of supplements. And so that's how I got started in the industry. What what really turned my career around was when I realized what I enjoyed doing was working with the doctors and the formulators and the researchers, the introverts behind the scenes and helping them tell their stories. So did those people have something in common other than being introverts? Were there kind of a common thread that you were like, okay, these folks I can relate to, I can really help them articulate their message and get the word out? Yeah, most of them, what they have in common is what I call the anti-entrepreneur. You know, most entrepreneurs have been, I think this is changing now, but they've been portrayed as hustlers and go-getters and extroverts, all the above. And all of these people, they were intuitive and empathic and caring, service-oriented people. And that was the polar opposite. But what was interesting about them is most of them had ideas that were so complex, it was really hard for them to break them down and convey them to an audience in a way that the audience could accept or understand even. So that became my skill set, helping these people translate their often really complex messages for a mass audience. Do you feel like in some ways that they have, do they have an advantage in some areas over kind of the traditional entrepreneur type? Do you think? Well, that is a good question because yes, I think they do. And it's by their very nature of the fact that they deal with complex ideas, they're thinkers, they're researchers. Here's people often ask, all right, why do you specialize in alternative practitioners or integrative practitioners or holistic, whatever we want to call them? These are typically medical practitioners who have embraced extracurricular methodologies for helping people. And some of them are not mainstream. We know about a lot of them today. And so what they have that has made content marketing especially work for this group of people is they have extra ways, additional ways of talking about mainstream medicine that creates topic clusters in the old SEO uh, language that really helps us market and sell their ideas. And so that's why I like working with them. We work with a lot of doctors too, medical doctors as well, selling their books. But I enjoy people with that extra added topic uh, knowledge, domain experience, that makes sense. So so how do you go about kind of getting all that gold that's within them out of their head and onto, you know, either a computer screen or a book like you mentioned? Right. Um, <clears throat> back in the old days, when clients first started coming to me, every single one of them thought that the way to launch them, their careers, the way to launch to become an authority was the old 70s model, you know, where a a doctor would appear on Johnny Carson, then the book's a big hit, or appear on Oprah, right? And so that's why we uh, started 
focusing on helping them, quote unquote, market, write, market, sell, land an agent, land a publisher for books. But what the secret was, and that's why we call it entrepreneurship, which is uh, the digital digital uh, landscape that surrounds that book. So the way we help these doctors is they think they have to put everything they know into a magnum opus that's 800 pages and then release it to the world and their job's done. What we help them do is write that book one social post at a time, one article at a time, and then that thread, those patterns converge into maybe an ebook. And then with response from the audience, it eventually becomes a book. So for us, the landscape is first the platform, the content. Yeah. And then you, sense. you help them kind of um, gather these nuggets out in social posts. And then over time, mm -hmm. they kind of, um, group together in, in little kind of mini chapters and then you organize it into a finished product of a book at some point? Yeah, I'll give you a couple examples. Um, one of our biggest successes was a doctor who embraced, back when SEO worked really, really well, now it's really difficult for a lot of people. Uh, but back in the old days, in the Wild West, when SEO worked wonderfully easy for everyone, at least for us, <laughs> that's how we got most of our people, you know, launched. SEO. And uh, what we'd do is we'd write three or four articles, place them on the site. If we were using social media, we'd uh, put those nuggets on social media, and then we'd watch for a response. And so that the, the ideas don't exist in a vacuum. And every book is better, and every product we've released is better because of that, because the response from an audience We'd send emails out and the audience would respond and say, what I really want is this. So from that, we'd create the first digital product and try that out, see if it had legs, see if it sold. If the digital product sold, then we'd keep building the list and that's what would attract uh, publishers. Publishers just wanted the audience. And so the bigger we could make the audience, the more the advance was. That probably sounds cold and calculating, but let's, that's the way it was. Kind of still is. So did I answer your question or did I ramble? Well, I'm just trying to get understanding, like you're using terms and I want to make sure the listener understands, like yeah. when you say um, they respond, like what does a response mean? Is that them just like thumbs up in a post? Does it mean that they're engaging in a conversation? Like what is, I'm just trying Great to question. kind yeah, of that's get awesome granular. Question. We, uh, what we look for is conversation, not just thumbs up not just uh, we look for, yeah, those metrics are great. The thumbs up, the uh, follows, the shares, all that good stuff. What we look for, especially in email, email is our primary marketing engine. We look for someone who takes the time to write a response, ask questions, curious, engaged with the ideas. Those are the best. Those are gold. And we used to get them uh, as comments on blog posts, no more. We Now we focus on email, sometimes social media, depending on the doctor. So that's the process. We're looking for engagement. Now, when they're starting out and they don't have that large of a list, like mm -hmm. do sometimes they get nothing and sometimes they get one? Like, is it possible to kind of, it doesn't matter, like if they get one response, it, like you got to really kind of emphasize that and build on that? Yes, exactly. And we also have now that I've been doing this for 30 years, we have a network of former clients who now have huge lists. And we share, happily share with new and upcoming doctors. So they have instant access to an audience. So um, that really helps. So that way they're, they're always getting some response. Feedback, right. It's always about the feedback. And, uh, you know, the, my former clients are more than happy to help the up and coming doctors, as long as the ideas are interesting and fascinating and new, different, and is, they usually are. Now, is there kind of um, milestone metrics that you use? Like, what's a minimum audience and what's a minimum kind of response that you think is okay? That's worth noting. That's worth kind of building on. Ah, boy, it really depends. I'll be honest. Depends on the uh, depends on the practitioner. A lot of practitioners that come through my course, for example just have a virtual online practice. They're a health coach or they're a, you know, a psychologist who became a coach 
and they have a very small audience, very small reach. And so they're not going to have many metrics, to be honest, at first, even if we help them out, give them access to an email list with a digital product we created. So it really depends, I'll be honest. And now, it also depends on what we're, how we're building their stack. Are, are they already on social media? Do we need to build that, et cetera? Now, when you build up to this book, is the book then becomes their main revenue stream? Um, no, or it, rarely, so, rarely if ever. So, so that's kind <laughs> yeah. of a that's a misconception about it authorship, is. isn't it? It is. It really is. It is. It rarely, if ever. I mean, I can count on. We've had seven number one bestsellers, right? That's what everybody seeks. Uh, but rarely has that become the in- income stream. Instead, it's the digital products. And the speaking engagements uh, and the opportunities for working with other email lists, the book brings those opportunities, but the book rarely. I've had one book now that's been uh, in hardcover for going on 20 years, never has gone to paperback. Back. It's a perennial bestseller, but that's one book in 30 years. Do you uh, do you feel like the book is more important for building authority? Um, do you feel like do you feel like paper builds more authority than online, or is it equal? Or what's how does that? Uh, it's uh, actually it's being in someone's feed or email box consistently over time. Mm. That's what builds authority and trust and expertise. The book really is almost, uh, it's become an on-ramp to that. It becomes, let's offer the book as a way to get them on the list. Let's offer the book as a freemium to get them to enjoy the course. So you're, the way you're kind of flipping the the yeah. like old marketing paradigm. That's right. And every once in a while, we have someone who has a big contract with a big New York publisher, and they want to market like the old days where we, you know, do all the games, play all the tricks, pull out all the stops. You know all of those. You've you've seen how those launches, quote unquote, work, even though the New York mm-hmm. Times is kind of on to all of them. But they really want to go old school. They really want that number one spot. And so we'll do that with them. But at the same time, we're also building the landscape, the content landscape around that What I'm interested in, what they really are too, when they admit it, is not just a number one launch. They really want a book with legs, a book that has influence and sells multiple copies every month for years. That's when we have influence from a book. But isn't the book just another kind of tool in the tool belt? Because you're ultimately trying to build a community, and these are all kind of um, assets in and around that. That's right. Yes, that's right. But in marketing, we need to work with what the prospect believes coming in. And still, uh, they believe when they come to see me that they have to start with a book. And so I had to write something that's literally called, don't start with the book. <laughs> so you, yeah. were, you were trying to manage their expectations from the uh, beginning. <laughs> exactly. That's right. But it's it's the real hope. I mean, d- don't we all, we want our authority to just uh, be launched and then stay. We're just an authority and an expert. Wow. Today, it doesn't work that way. You've got to release that book in little increments over time, over and over and over again. And that's why I like Instagram. Instagram is awesome right now for my audience. Uh, it's where their people are. And the way we're using it is, is going gangbusters as long as we also use it with uh, email marketing and a platform where we can send people to buy stuff, clearly. So that's what we're doing. Do you uh, do you tend to get much pushback on that sort of thinking? Because I know like you're a consultant, you're working with people who aren't experts in marketing. Mm-hmm but they have an idea of the way it's supposed to work. Um, Do you get pushback? And if you do, how do you manage those expectations and help them to see the right way to go? Okay. Pushback against which part I get pushback all the time. So which, which pushback are we referring to David? Uh, Specifically on like kind of old school versus new school way of doing things that the, the big book and the big like flash Mm -hmm. as opposed to sort of that ongoing consistent drip feed is more what I'm thinking. Well, since they're the client, we will give them the launch they want, as long as they also agree 
to play along with me and build the content around it. And if we can do that and agree, then old and new can get along. But there really is not. I mean, I'm. It's really amusing to me because I came up in the old days, in the 80s, pre-internet, and we've just replaced all the old tech with new tech. The glossy catalogs, you know, are just your shopping cart plug-in and all mm-hmm. the mail we used to send out is just in your email box and talk radio is the podcast. It's the same conversation. It's the same conversion. It's the same, you know, relationship building, just a different medium. Ed and I were talking about that the other day, you know, the idea that like tactics and technology change, but people really don't. They don't. You no. know, stuff that was that worked a hundred years ago, you know, you update the technology, it still works today. That's right. Exactly. It does. But something that is different today is that there are, a lot of this stuff is free and a lot of this stuff is uh, there's much more fragmentation in terms of attention. Mm -hmm. Um, How do you kind of, while the, while the principles might be the same, the, uh, the ability to get someone's attention and keep it over time is a little more competitive nowadays, I think. Yeah, it is. And that's why we niche so deeply in the beginning because um, every doctor I've worked with, we niche narrowly, narrowly and deeply in the beginning. We find something for them that they can own. And that's how we first build their first platform. And then they can branch out. But every doctor I can name that we've worked with started with a very, very narrow niche. And so you have to, you must well, start with a niche. T- talk about that exercise that you help them get into a, you know, to own their kind of tiny slice of the universe. How do you help them identify what is that appropriate size niche? And then um, is it big enough to at least get their focus for a period of time so they believe that it's possible to build off of that? Okay. I'm trying to think of one of the, one of the uh, uh, techniques we use in the course, but what I like to have them focus on is every, every expert wants to focus on how they do something. So, uh, like, for example, a famous example I always use is I had an acupuncturist from the UK who had this video on the front page of his site with him sticking needles in someone's face. And that focused on how he achieved pain relief. But people were terrified (laughs) of going to this guy. (laughs) Right. And so what we do instead, of course, is we focus on why you're doing what you're doing, who it's for, and what the what problems you solve. And so all I ask people to do is just, okay, who are you serving? Name three related problems you solve. That becomes the first niche. It's just three problems. And we build three pillars for those three problems. We test and see how they work. And then we rotate pillars. I use pillars because in the Rainmaker community, anyway, um, it's fairly common language, I think. At least used to be Mm -hmm. for categories along the top of the site, right? Yep. And so their niche just becomes the problems they solve. It's an easy way in because most people get so hung up on, oh, I've got to have the right uh, niche. The audience quickly tells us, these two are boring. This one's interesting. How can you reframe this one? And we just keep rotating Eventually, what we found was all five pillars or categories along the type of the site would be humming because we just watched it with heat maps as people arrived to see which of those problems resonated with audiences. And we do the same thing on social media. So it's a long way around of... of now, you, you mentioned that Instagram is working well for your clients now. Can you talk about that a little bit? Like what makes that work well or what are you doing there that uh, yeah. is so successful? Okay, I'm ready to give my big secret. So here we go. Because uh, I guess not a lot of people know this, but long content, believe it or not, long form content is back. And it's really quite amazing because Instagram wanted to be TikTok for a while. And so they thought they were going, maybe they still are. And they were going to embrace the reels and the quick hits, the videos. But once my clients started doing that, they just lost, people lost all interest. 
And so what we found, Instagram has a feature called carousels. Maybe you're familiar with those, you know, they're, mm-hmm. they're yeah, 10, 10 screens of type of content. And we make the first two slides hooky and interesting and fascinating because that's the way Instagram works. It'll show the, the, uh, the viewer the slide, the first slide, the first time they see it and the second slide the next time they see that in their feed. And we have found that carousels are outperforming every other um, form we could possibly use, including video. Now, there's a few people who are really great on video, and that can add to it. But people, at least the people we attract, the people who are looking for health solutions, the people who are in pain, they are looking for solutions. They want it to be able to remember it. They don't want a video to just flash by. They want notes. They want to take screenshots of those carousels. And engagement has just gone through the roof once we started using carousels. So we use carousels to get people off of Instagram, onto the email list, and then we've developed the relationship further with email. So that's our strategy at the moment. So you use use Instagram not to sell them anything, but to get them on the list so that you can eventually sell them something. Yeah. And it's been, it's been really interesting. I don't know how much you know about the health uh, alternative health world and how controversial it can be, but there's something called moderation online in social media, where if you say something controversial, it doesn't agree with the mainstream um, corporate stance on the issue. You'll be moderated out of existence. And so I don't want my people uh, building a platform on Instagram. It's not worth it. I had people during uh, the big uh, pandemic lose 300,000 followers overnight because they said something innocently they thought was just common sense. So moderation has been really interesting for us. And so what we prefer to do is every opportunity, get people off of social. Social is like, I look at it like the matrix You know, the matrix where, uh, you know, the green figures are scrolling down the black screen endlessly forever. That's Instagram. And it's not for selling. It's for capturing interest. And uh, we capture that with carousels and take them to the email. So what are some techniques you use to get them off of the platform onto your email? Well, if we've been really smart, we've been paying attention to the topics that are uh, resonating with people, that people are, you know, engaging with. And comments are so amazing on Instagram. We love the comments. The comments tell us everything. They tell us why they like it, why they hate it, uh, what they're going to do with it. Are they understanding the concept? And the minute we get that data, then um, uh, we, we develop a free, a free, a freebie, like, you know, in, a mini course or an ebook or something. Uh, the best um, freemium we've had has been checklists. The shorter, the better. And so we offer those, you know, 10 ways to know if X click, they go, they go to the site, the Rainmaker site and gather that ebook or checklist or mini course. And then they're on the list. So, so- yeah. Good. Yeah. Okay. No, go ahead, David. Uh, I was going to say, you mentioned just a minute ago something that I wanted to to kind of come back to. Mm-hmm. Moderation and that effect on the people yeah. that you work with. Yeah. Being that you have a very specific market, yeah. um, what are some of the challenges and opportunities and things in that? Because a lot of people, like you said, have not necessarily engaged with that space. What is it like being in that space as a marketer? Mm-hmm. It's really challenging and it's not, it hasn't really changed. Um, And this is one of the benefits I think of coming up with supplements in the 1980s. Uh, Supplements are regulated. The labels are regulated by the FDA Mm -hmm. for obvious reasons. And so we had label restrictions and they extend to the catalogs we'd print and the mail pieces we'd send out, obviously. Right. So we became very, very, very good at, um, creating content that didn't get us in trouble. And nowadays, oh, these poor younger doctors will just wander onto social media and start spouting off every everything they believe 
as of last week and lose their audiences. And so we have a course where we walk people through what we say online and what we say behind a paywall and why, why that's so necessary because it has been, I don't know, I don't know how to describe it. It's been um, really difficult for, we had one doctor who lost 600,000 people. And that is something that's hard to recover from because he hadn't built anything other than social media. He didn't have an email yeah. list. That's dangerous. So that's why we do it the way we do it. Now, because of your background, you you probably at a glance can tell where the edges are, where oh, somebody, totally. somebody new yeah. is just, they don't understand what they don't understand. That's right. Yeah. I mean, let's be honest. It's always been about the advertisers. Let's call it the advertisers. Whether they're advertising on social media or not, right, uh, they have the cash. And so the advertisers in our case are, well, uh, you know, pharma, and they're touchy, and they don't like people saying bad things about their products. I don't blame them. And we had the same problem in the 80s. We'd do radio, we'd do TV, and the advertisers would say, you can't say that. They're our advertiser. And so I don't see this as necessarily uh, censorship or it's, you know, the evil big foot of government or any of that stuff. I see it as the usual same old thing it's always been. Advertisers don't like people saying bad things about their product. So let's just play that game. Let's play along. And that's what we do. Right. And there's always parameters. I mean, this is just becomes Clearly. another parameter. Oh, yeah. There's very clear parameters sometimes. Lately, they're constantly changing the restrictions. And you don't know why you get kicked off. So... It is kind of a wild west out there right now, um, as we found with Twitter uh, and the Twitter files, if you know about that. Sure. But, now, yeah. now are, are the things that you're sharing today for your clients, is that what you're doing to get clients? Or are you at a stage right now that people know who you are and they're going to you to solve their marketing problem? We're, we're fortunate. We, you know, we're primarily word of mouth from clients now, and we stay pretty busy. My favorite form of marketing is email. It always has been. And, you know, we went through a period where people, when Facebook first started up, where everybody was claiming email was dead. You remember that. And email is still 10x for us. Anything we could do on mm -hmm. Facebook or Instagram, it's still 10x. We still sell most of our product uh, through email. And my model is pretty simple. I build the email lists with my clients and then we teach their email list how to do the same thing. And so my clients will recommend me to their list and we sell the course to them. And uh, it just is a virtuous cycle. And I've done that with all my clients. So, you, so yeah. You mentioned email as being something that's been really, really effective for you. That's obviously been around for a long, long mm -hmm. time, yeah. as you said. Yeah. What about moving forward? What's some of the stuff that you're really excited about, you know, in the near term and the future for your particular market, uh, mm -hmm. as far as tactics, techniques, platforms, media? Okay, well, that's a good question. And I haven't thought about that. I like focusing on what's working now. But yeah. I can tell you what... Um, I am wary of, and can I mention product names on here? Is that okay or is that bad? You know, like Slack or or Substack or, or uh, Medium. Whatever. Should be fine. Yeah, you're oh, good. good. Okay, good. So uh, I what really is kind of uh, annoying me right now is let's take Substack. It's the big kid on the block at the moment. A lot of people think it's going to be easier to attract an audience if they throw their content onto an email, uh, you know, blog. it's just a typical blog platform that sends out an email. It's FeedBlitz. It's what Seth Godin has been doing for 40 years or whatever. Yep. You're right. So they're putting it on. They're thinking, believing that somehow that will make a difference and help them find their audience. And I can't see any difference with these platforms than a typical WordPress stack that we use. So um, I think there's going to be a lot more of that coming because every uh, tech provider, not Rainmaker, but most of them want to create a walled garden of exclusives that you can't leave ever. So mm -hmm. 
uh, that is what I'm warning against as a, you know the future for my clients is keep it simple, keep it clean, keep it flexible. WordPress stack. But I think that almost gets back to uh, kind of the point you were making earlier about social media, that rented versus owned space. Yes. You know, yeah. where you're at, you're beholden to something that you don't control. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, Brian Clark talked about that a lot way back mm-hmm. in the day. And uh, I agree with that a hundred percent. And that's what we found out during the pandemic. All those rented spaces where you did not own your audience suddenly disappeared out from under you. I mean, how scary is that? So that's why I love the simple minimum viable website. If you can call it that, you only have to have six pages and six pages, an about page, three articles, a work with me page, a home page. Let's get on social media. Let's get you an audience, get you an email list. And then you own that platform for now anyway. That, you know, it's what they say. If something's free, then you're the product. So, exactly. I mean, exactly. It's true. Those, those, it's really true. Those yeah. platforms are just taking advantage of that. Yeah. And who can blame them, really? I mean, it's a great model for them. So now, um, what could we be doing for you? How can we help you? What do you mean? How can we help you? What do you need more of? <laughs> um, let's see. That's a an unexpected question. Uh, you mean from Rainmaker? Yeah. No, I mean, from your business, what can the audience do to help Keith oh. Reese have all of his dreams come true? <laughs> <laughs> Go to KeithReese.com and join my email list. How about that? And hey, can you spell one. that? Because uh, for folks... Oh, who- yes. It is unusual. It's K-E-I-T-H-R-H-Y-S. Keith Reese. If they go to KeithReese.com, they can get some information. They can learn more about yes. your philosophy and your practice. Yeah, we have a new uh, a new freemium coming out called Parallel Practice. And it's been so fun because what we do is all of our service providers are so busy providing services, they don't have time to market, they think, right? So we built a simple model that's four steps that they implement in parallel to their service practice. And uh, we've been testing it and with 200 health coaches and it's been spectacular. So that's what they get when they go over to keithreese.com. And then your ideal uh, um, prospect is somebody that is a health practitioner that wants to expand their practice in term into the area of content creation and then create additional revenue streams through uh, content in a variety of ways. Yes. That's typically um, my real dream clients are those who desperately want to get something out into the world that they care about deeply. And they want, they're not really interested in being seen as an expert or an authority necessarily, but they believe so passionately in something they've researched or found or discovered with patients that they have to get it out there. They're my favorite clients, but we help anyone who is in the wellness space because they need our help getting, uh, being, um, I like to say, we help them translate their big ideas into common language. So that's what we help them do. And now are, like they, are they typically, uh, are they coming to you first before they've tried or have they tried and become frustrated and are at their wits end and say, hey, maybe I'll hang out with Keith for a while. You know, is this just me? You guys tell me, but no, almost every single one of my clients have tried every single tactic and, you know, platform and everything and, and failed miserably. And then after they spent all their money, they come to us. And so that's typically the way it's been for us. Now, the reason I launched the course six years ago, Evergreen Authority, was because I wanted to build more clients who came up the right way with the right foundation, the right marketing foundation. That's a four-month course, right? So that was the initial idea. We put 2,000 people through there, and they go through the whole course. And what's been great about that is I create my own clients. They're already ready to engage and just hit the ground running because they know the principles of content marketing. So that's been our strategy. Well, Keith, thank you so much for sharing your story. You're doing important work and we appreciate you. Hey, thank you. We appreciate it, David. 
Yeah. All right. This is Lee, Lee Cantor for David Brandon. We will see you all next time on Digital Marketing Done Right.